Today's lecture is probability two. Today we're going to talk about a few advanced uh, probability measures that you can use in genetics problems. So the first objective for today is we want to talk about the addition and multiplication rules, but uh, not just in context of a monohybrid cross, but also in the context of a dihybrid cross, as you see here. The second thing we'd like to talk about is using probability method to predict the results uh, for a cross involving multiple characters, so five or more. Just a quick refresher, multiplication rule is when you have a sequence of events that are all going to happen. So if you ask a question like this, what's the probability of rolling a two on the first roll and a three on the second roll, the keyword is and. If you're saying and, remember the probability of each roll itself is going to be one sixth, right? So one sixth probability roll a two, one sixth you'll roll a three. But if you're saying and, you're saying they both have to happen, you multiply. One sixth times one sixth is one thirty sixth. And remember, a quality control check, it's harder to roll a 2 and a 3 sequentially than just a 2 or just a 3. So this fraction better be less than either of the individual probabilities, which it is. So that's the multiplication rule. Quick reminder on the addition rule. The addition rule is if you ask a question like this, what's the probability of rolling either a 2 or a 3 on a single roll? So the probability of rolling a 2 is 1 6, the probability of rolling a 3 is 1 6, here we're saying either one of those would work to satisfy this question. So in this case, you're adding. When you add fractions, remember you're adding the numerator. So 1 plus 1 is 2, and then the denominator stays you know, what it is. So the answer to this is 2 sixths, or if you simplify, it's 1 third. Remember, quality control check. Is this answer here greater than either component, which it should be? because it's easier to say I could roll a 2 or a 3 to satisfy this problem as opposed to saying I could only roll a 2 or only roll a 3. Okay, so let's apply the multiplication and addition rules at the same time. So this is a slightly more advanced genetics problem. Let's consider the same cross we did uh, before in the previous lecture in probability 1. So we're crossing two heterozygotes. Remember we're talking about albinism. So big A encodes for normal pigmentation, little a encodes for albino, and big A is dominant to little a. So you could see here's our Punnett square, here's our genotypic results. If we translate those to phenotypes, any organism that has one big A, that will dominate the little a, and so they'll have normal pigmentation, it's three quarters. And then you could see that one quarter will be albino. So those are the phenotypes that we see. Let's ask a different question here. So what is the probability of these parents having one albino child and two children with normal pigmentation? Notice here that I have not uh, dictated the order in which this has to occur. This is a key thing that you want to keep in mind, and this is what makes us use both the multiplication and the addition rules. So again, let's say child number one, let's pretend that you know, he or she is going to be albino, so that's a one quarter chance. Child number two will have normal pigmentation, that's three quarters, and child number three will have normal pigmentation. The odds of this happening is nine sixty-fourths. All right, one times three times three is nine, then we multiply the denominator. 4 times 4 is 16, times 4 is 64. So 9 64 is probability that we will have these three children. Now we have to ask ourselves, does this satisfy the question? And the question is, what's the probability of these parents having one albino child and two children with normal pigmentation? It does satisfy the question, but is it the only way you can answer this question? And the answer is, of course, no, because the question is not specifying order. So if the question was specifying order, you would be done right now, but it's not. Since it's not, we have to go ahead and think of other situations. So this would be scenario one. Let's consider another scenario. What if the first child had normal pigmentation, the second child was albino, and the third child had norm normal pigmentation? You could see here all we did was switch things around. We changed the place of the albino child. In scenario one, the albino child was the first child. In scenario two, the albino child is the second child. The math is going to work out the same. We're just switching the order of the fractions. So the answer for the second scenario is still going to be 9 64 We'll call that scenario two. Are those the only two scenarios that could satisfy this problem? And you're probably imagining it's not, right? The albino child could be the third child. So let's consider that situation. So here's that situation. You could see that we switched the albino child to the third. Same math, right? Multiplying same fractions. So here, the answer to this scenario, we'll call scenario three, is 9 64 So you could see that any of these individual scenarios, one, two, or three, notice the wording I'm using, right? Either scenario one, or scenario two, or scenario three could satisfy this question 
If any of these can, then we have to implement the addition rule for the second part of the problem. So we're saying scenario one or scenario two, remember the or indicates we've got to put a plus sign, or scenario three, again another plus sign, any of those will satisfy the scenario. So what we have to do then is we have to add these probabilities going down. I put it over here just to emphasize the scenario one or scenario two or scenario three. But if I add these three fra fractions on the right, you could see that I get 927, or sorry, excuse me, <laughs> I add nine three times, so one, two, three, right? Nine times three is 27. And then the denominator stays the same when you're adding fractions. So it's 27 over 64, and that's the final answer to this problem. So you could see that we implemented the multiplication rule going across these rows, and then we implemented the addition rule going down. Let's talk about something else. So this is a nice pun and square doing a dihybrid cross. Uh, where you could see that we did the typical Punnett square that we've done in our previous lectures. And we get our nice little 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Now, to do this problem, going from the F1 generation to the F2, and in this case we're talking about seed color, if you recall. So big Y encodes for yellow seeds, little y encodes for green, but big Y is dominant to little y, so we only see green if we have two little y's. And then you could see that big R encodes for round. So anytime there's a big R, you have a round seed. If you have little r, little r, little r encodes for uh, wrinkled. So anytime you see little r, little r, you have wrinkled seeds. And then this here would be, again, our double mutant, right? Where it's mutant for color, in other words, it's green. And it's mutant for shape, in other words, it's wrinkled. We could do the problem this way. There's nothing wrong with it, but it takes a while. If we use probability, there's a simpler method, or a more simple method that we could use called the branching method. So this is another method you want to add to your repertoire. And what this method is, is you take each gene individually. Again, looking at Mendel's principle of independent assortment. In other words, the way the alleles for the Y gene assort have nothing to do or do not affect the way the alleles for the R gene assort. So we break them apart. We say, OK, let's cross big Y, little y with big Y, little y. We're just doing that cross. We get that here. And then what we do is we say, OK, this would yield what? These three individuals here would be yellow, right? because they all have at least one big Y. So 3 quarters are yellow. This individual would be green, so 1 quarter is green. And I'm done with that, that uh, gene now. Now what I do is I turn my attention to the R gene. I do the same cross here, big R, little r, big R, little r, and I get these ratios here. These three are round, this one's wrinkled. So what we're saying is this, and this is the branching, this is where the branching comes in. Of the three quarters that are yellow, three quarters of those will be round, so they're yellow and round. Of the three quarters that are yellow, one quarter of those will be wrinkled, so they're yellow and wrinkled. This is the branching. We do the same thing for the one quarter that we're green to start with. So of the one quarter that are green, three quarters of those will be round, and three quarters of those will be wrinkled. Now the final part is simply this. We're saying let's extend the branches. Let's do the math. So if three quarters are yellow and three quarters are round, we go three quarter times three quarter equals nine sixteenths are yellow and round. Notice the final branch. We continue that for all of these, and you could see that what we end up getting is the same 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio that we, that we normally see. Uh, you'll notice a little uh, typo on my problem here, actually, I just noticed. <laughs> so please uh, you know, adjust your notes here. You could see that this 1 quarter should actually, or this number 4 should be 16, this should be 16, this should be 16. I uh, forgot to multiply the denominator in these final three. So all of these are out of 16. So change this to 16, this to 16, this to 16. And then you see your 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio that you get. So the branching method is very powerful. It's often very uh, quick. So it's a bit faster than doing a typical pun and square. The final thing I'd like to go over here is how we use probability method when considering a cross with five or more genes. So in this case, we have five genes. I'm not going to say uh, what these uh, genes uh, encode for, in other words, what character they affect. I'm not going to say what the big letter or the little letter is. We don't really need to know that for this problem. But rather, let's just consider a typical scenario here. So let's ask this question. So if these are the parents, what's the probability of obtaining a child with the genotype little a, little a, little b, little b, etc.? Right? So homozygous recessive for all the genes. What's the probability? 
So what we hear, what we do here again, is again invoking uh, Mendel's principle of independent assortment, along with the multiplication method. So what we say is, let's just cross gene A. So we're breaking this apart. So if we cross big A little A with big A little A, I'm not going to draw it out anymore now. Uh, I think you could probably do it in your head at this point. So if we cross those two, we could say that one quarter of those will be little a little a. Now let's do it for uh, gene B. We're crossing big B little b with big B little b, and we can see that one or one quarter of uh, those will be little b little b of their offspring. We continue that all the way down the line. If we cross little c little c, so it's a bit different than the other ones, right? With big C little c, we see one half of the offspring will be little c little c. If we continue that all the way down the line, these are the numbers we get, and then we have to decide, okay, we did each gene individually, now we've got to unite them back together, because this organism is not just composed of one gene, right? Gene A, it's composed of, composed of five genes. So we've got to reunite them now. So how do we do that? Well, let me ask you this. What rule would we invoke? Is it multiplication or is it addition? Are we saying, if it's a multiplication, we're saying this individual is little a, little a, and little b, little b, and little c, little c, and little d, little d, and little e, little e. That's what we're saying. We're saying the organism is all of that. If we're doing addition rule, we're saying the organism is little a, little a, or little b, little b, or little c, little c, etc. Obviously, we're not saying the latter, right? We're not saying or, because they're not pieces of the genotype. It's the whole genotype. So we're not using the addition rule. Rather, we're using the multiplication rule. So we're going to multiply these uh, fractions all the way across. And the answer we should get, if my math is correct, is 1 over 256. You can see we're using basically just a portion of the branching method, uh, along with Mendel's principle of independent assortment, to very quickly figure out what the odds of getting this genotype are uh, if these are the parents and this is the offspring. You could imagine if we did a Punnett square all the way through with this, it would take probably a day to finish this problem. But this is a quick way to do it. So that's the probability 2 lecture. Uh, we talked about how to apply addition and multiplication rules to dihybrid crosses, how to do them simultaneously, too. And then we also talked about uh, using the branching method to uh, invoke a cross involving five or more. Really, it's genes. They have characters here. It could be, right? But really, it's genes, because it could be that all the genes are affecting the same character. So I would cross this out, actually, on this slide and the title slide and write the word genes.